DreamWorks has one of the more interesting reputations when it comes to companies in the animation industry. Not just because the reason for their inception was to flip off Disney, but also because when it comes to DreamWorks, you're never entirely sure of what you're going to get. It's been said that DreamWorks' filmography is like a buffet. There's a lot of options and not everything is going to appeal to everyone. And while this can lead to people going into plenty of their films with either inflated expectations or expecting nothing at all, it allows DreamWorks to constantly experiment and produce films that have the chance of finding more success among a different demographic compared to another. Usually, when companies tend to have a reputation of being hit or miss of their products, this can end up being more of a curse than a blessing. Consistent quality will typically result in better sales, and trying to appeal to a wide spectrum of audiences with different films catered to specific people within will usually end up making your company incredibly polarizing. The Prince of Egypt is a dark, mature retelling of the Book of Exodus, boasting absolutely incredible traditional animation and a powerful voice cast that assists the retelling of Moses leading the Jewish out of Egypt. Then you got Shrek the Third. Make no mistake, when DreamWorks hit a home run, they really hit a home run. How to Train Your Dragon is one of my favorite trilogies ever, and no one's denying the brilliance of the first two Shrek films, the greatness of Kung Fu Panda, Jack Black, my beloved. I could go on. But let's face the facts here. DreamWorks is often very hit or miss, yet for some reason, I greatly appreciate that about them. DreamWorks making tons of different films that appeal to a wide range of different demographics, especially in present times where people are beginning to feel indifferent to the works of Disney and Pixar due to them sticking to their classic ingredients, I made a video about that by the way, check it out if you haven't, is a massive breath of fresh air. And this willingness to experiment has allowed many DreamWorks films to triumph over the competition that sticks to their tried and true formulas and animation styles. This isn't to say that DreamWorks is overall better than any other company releasing animated movies these days, but there's a lot more to their recent research and overwhelming praise than Puss in Boots The Last Wish, although yes, that film did contribute heavily. This video isn't trying to chase the trend of only reviewing Last Wish and then acting like DreamWorks is on some sort of divine comeback. I wanted to take a look at how DreamWorks has been riding on the waves of success throughout 2022 and into 2023, with the release of The Bad Guys and Puss in Boots The Last Wish, while also discussing DreamWorks' future films and the reason why their approach to being experimental with their films is a good thing despite the inherent inconsistency. DreamWorks don't always crank out hits but there are a massive change of pace and a good breath of fresh air in a medium that is largely oversaturated with films that play it mostly safe. And I don't just mean narrative-wise, not about to act like the bad guys is a revolutionary work of art or anything. I think you an explanation. From the very beginning, DreamWorks was a company driven by pure spite. It wasn't very subtle. Yet despite this, the films they put out were of mostly solid quality. They were a company that could regularly stick it to Disney while simultaneously making films that were far edgier. Not in like, you know. I mean, their films had much more of a biting edge to them. There were a large number of jokes that appealed to adults, and the films in general were far less whimsical or had this sense of magic that was closely associated with Disney for the longest time. And their defiance towards conforming to the usual expectations of animated movies at the time gave them a lot of room to experiment and carve a unique identity for themselves. Shrek was obviously the film that launched DreamWorks into the mainstream. I don't count Chicken Run because that was Aardman's work, and I am offended that the people who distributed it are parading it around as their victory. And at the time, Shrek was one of the only mainstream films that gleefully took the piss out of Disney every chance it could, but also did so in a way that was funny and creative, immediately setting DreamWorks apart from the rest, making them a ton of bank and getting them even more praise with the sequel, and being their gateway to mainstream success. Then they followed it up with Shark Tale. I think it's worth noting that the main thing that has remained consistent about DreamWorks is how inconsistent they are. No matter what era of DreamWorks you look at, there's usually a good quantity of films that are completely out there, and then there's a random handful of genuinely fantastic gems thrown into the mix, and they're all clearly very experimental. DreamWorks originally did a lot of hand-drawn stuff, like Prince of Egypt, El Dorado, very underrated by the way, Spirit, and Sinbad, while at the same time keeping 3D animation on the table until Shrek 2 proved that their 3D outings were going to be far more successful. And also because Disney killed Treasure Planet, which I will always be angry about, DreamWorks would then constantly create new IPs, most of which being comedies, before finally landing on Kung Fu Panda, which brought plenty of heart and soul that was missing from the experiments, while also being a much more mature film. In many ways, it can be seen as DreamWorks throwing sh** at a wall and seeing what sticks, seeing as Monsters vs. Aliens released one year away from How to Train Your Dragon. But there are clearly attempts at making solid films here, not just by the numbers comedy flicks. Megamind's plot isn't mind-blowing, but it's still 
an extremely entertaining subversion of the genre. Peabody and Sherman's plot is convoluted but retains its heart and fast paced humour. Rise of the Guardians was an attempt at making a whole new franchise with surprisingly layered world building, and it only didn't take off because they put Jack Frost in the fight against James Bond and went, yeah, that's fair. Point is, DreamWorks aren't just putting minimal effort into every film, they're constantly experimenting with new IPs, spanning different genres, and when they finally get the right people behind the right project, their output often rivals or in many cases trumps its competition. Although I guess it is worth noting that a lot of DreamWorks' weaker films are the ones that are mainly aimed at much younger children, while a lot of their most well-received ones are the entries that either strike the perfect balance of family-friendly entertainment, strike a great balance between fun spectacle and compelling drama, or are just borderline adult films. But that shouldn't devalue them. I think a lot of people in the cartoon community tend to get way too upset whenever DreamWorks announces another Trolls movie or a Boss Baby movie. Like, yeah, they aren't great films, and I agree that kids at that age should have better films than that, but they're also clearly not for you. You can usually tell when a DreamWorks film is made with you in mind, and that's what I find most interesting. And when DreamWorks' output has always been incredibly out there from its inception, there's no real use in crying about them not making something that appeals to you, as eventually they will put out something that you will either enjoy or be genuinely captivated by. A lot of DreamWorks' films are also adaptations of existing works, but they usually add a wildly different spin to them, or at the very least allow them to stand out so they can't be directly compared to the source material. Like seriously, try and identify the similarities in How to Train Your Dragon. Toothless look like this. This is a very messy segment, but the sheer variety on display with DreamWorks, even though not every film they make is a winner, is honestly pretty refreshing compared to other studios. They aren't ultra refined, nor are they necessarily better all the time, but it's the constant experimentation to see what works while still putting out mostly okay films surrounding their big ones that has allowed them to remain relevant, and in this day and age, that's greatly appreciated. It's not just their critically acclaimed output from last year, there have been thousands of people showing their appreciation for the humour of the Madagascar movies, the insanity of B-movie even existing. Hell, Rise of the Guardians is considered by many to be an underrated classic these days. Part of this is probably nostalgia, but I also think it shows that DreamWorks' wildly different output of films is a working strategy. They make plenty of films that appeal to different people, and continue to do so even after they find overwhelming success with a universally acclaimed film. DreamWorks is not necessarily better than Disney and Pixar overall, but in comparison to a lot of samey animated films in recent memory, people have begun to show them a lot more appreciation. Alright, rant over, let's hop onto bad guys. The Bad Guys, based on the book of the same name, is a pretty good movie. Disregarding the obvious, immediately you're hit with the film's visuals which are very clearly Spider-Verse inspired while still making it their own unique art style. I've been gushing about 2D and 3D hybrid films for a while now and I'll definitely keep gushing about it when it comes to this movie. The reason why I feel it's necessary to discuss the animation is because this was the first DreamWorks film to really experiment with it. DreamWorks has always had a semi-realistic aesthetic in many of their previous films, with the exception being the Captain Underpants movie, but whereas that film seemed to be a one-off amid the other films that were released before and after, The Bad Guys feels like DreamWorks' first major attempt at reinventing itself visually, retroactively giving their films a lot more style and personality. DreamWorks was also one of the first major animation studios, you know, going off of how recognisable they are, that really tried to innovate with this style. Sure, Turning Red and Luca had more unconventional and 2D inspired designs compared to other Pixar films, but they still had a lot of Pixar's trademark realistic detail. The Bad Guys is a heist movie with plenty of action scenes that will look absolutely spectacular, especially the car chases which fully embrace the exaggerated action lines. But even when the film isn't constantly moving, the characters are incredibly expressive and cartoony, and the design of the world in general embraces the idea of reducing the realistic detail, by removing a rich amount of world detail that you would have seen in previous DreamWorks films, and replacing it with flatter but far more abstract and eye-catching textures, while primarily animating on 2s, 3s and 4s, while at the same time keeping the luscious lighting of many of DreamWorks' films that manages to enhance the handmade and illustrated look they were going for. It's great to see DreamWorks embracing the style of animation while not directly copying Spider-Verse's comic book aesthetic, going for its own look while standing out amid its contemporaries. Now, narratively, The Bad Guys isn't nearly as strong, with a fairly predictable story, and it doesn't really have a whole lot to say. However, I don't mind this so long as the story itself is entertaining and the characters are just as fun to watch. This is a film that's aiming to be a cartoony and entertaining heist comedy, which again shows that DreamWorks is more than willing to make vastly different films, especially for their original IPs. I mean, their last movie before this one, if you don't count Troll Hunters, was Boss Baby 2, which was, uh, well, well, 
Boss Baby 2. I mean, as long as the execution is solid and the result is entertaining, you have my attention. Like, this movie has a twist villain, something I'm sure all of you are tired of. Yet, despite the twist being expected, it isn't lazily executed. There are hints given without completely changing the villain's character and personality, and the villain is also fun to watch regardless. And even outside of making sure the predictable plot works, the execution of the whole film is pretty admirable. I mean, this movie opens with a homage to Pulp Fiction. Like, I I'm sorry? Are you trying to make me hard? It's an incredibly strong opening with a great tracking shot. All heist movies need tracking shot openings, actually. The characters, despite Wolf and Snake being given most of the attention, are all a lot of fun and bounce off each other really well, even if they do have some of the film's less desirable qualities. Yeah, DreamWorks were worried that they may have made the film too good, so they threw in some fart jokes and called it a day. There's not a whole lot else to discuss. The Bad Guys is an incredibly stylish and fun film that I truly believe is breaking new ground for DreamWorks. Not in the narrative department, but in giving their films more of an identity and allowing themselves to fully take advantage of the medium of animation without having to stick to uncanny realism. Now, what most of you have probably been waiting for. I don't need to say a lot about this film. Everything that's been said about it has been already said. But I'm gonna do it anyway. Simply put, this is the most extreme upgrade from original film to sequel film I have ever seen. Period. Puss in Boots The Last Wish is easily one of the greatest things DreamWorks have ever made. How to Train Your Dragon has a very comfortable place in my heart, but it would be a disservice to Last Wish for me to compare it to anything. I'm of the opinion that the first Puss in Boots film was kind of ass. It has its moments, but a lot of it is boring and very forgettable. The only scene I remember is the ridiculous I was there the whole time moment, which was funny, but it's the only thing I remember from a 90 minute Shrek spin-off. The Last Wish had to convince a lot of people that it truly deserved to exist as a sequel one of DreamWorks' most overlooked yet divisive films. And let me tell you, I rewatched Puss in Boots 1 in preparation for Last Wish, and the amount of whiplash I experienced from the first 10 minutes of this film was immense. Hell, the first 5 minutes of Last Wish utterly annihilates the original movie. The animation is incredible. While it may take some getting used to, as Shrek is mainly known for having a semi-realistic aesthetic, the painterly hand-drawn quality of the backgrounds, textures, the gorgeous blending of 2D effects, the limited frame rate emphasizing the spectacular action scenes, the vibrant and striking coloring, the expressions of dynamic posing, I mean, this easily dwarfs the majority of DreamWorks' catalogue based on visuals alone. It's an aesthetic and art style that will not age. And if the upcoming Shrek 5 goes back to the realistic look, I'm not sure if I'm gonna like it. And I mean, Puss looks so good in this film, I completely forgot he looked like this in the older films. I cannot go back to this. But beyond the animation, Last Wish boasts a story with so many working parts, yet they fit together perfectly. This movie has three antagonists, and usually when a movie has like two antagonists it can be overwhelming and one of them always ends up being undercooked or underutilized. Not the case here. Each antagonist is such a memorable and impactful screen presence. Whether that's through getting us to care about and empathize with them like with Goldilocks, getting us to laugh at how much of an unbridled bleeder <laughs> Jack Horner is, or getting us to feel an overwhelming sense of dread and fear whenever death is on screen. The Last Wish isn't just being praised for being a better film than its predecessor, even by a long shot. It also has one of the best stories ever told in a DreamWorks movie. Working off of the silly premise of Puss in Boots using up 8 of his 9 lives and then immediately adjusting the tone so we know the stakes going forward. Death's introduction in this film is one of the greatest ways I've seen an antagonistic force be introduced. It's chilling and you legit begin to fear for Puss whenever he shows up throughout the course of the movie. And the thing is, he's not even a villain. Death is a force of nature who has come to take Puss's last life early after witnessing him use 8 of his lives already, not valuing what he has and acting as if he's invincible. He decides to play with his food, stalking Puss and reminding him of the inevitability of his death, and we witness Puss grow to treat his life seriously over the course of the film, valuing the people he loves and eventually facing death head on, proving his newfound resolve and forcing him to back down until the day Puss meets his natural end. Going off of who Puss in Boots was known for being in the Shrek films and even in his own original movie, that's one hell of a leap in thematic substance and character development. Taking this beloved side character and giving him the emotional depth and justice he rightfully deserved. I won't go over the panic attack scene, but my god, just thank you for that. This narrative is an example of what DreamWorks is capable of at their very best. It can get pretty dark, but never overwhelmingly so. There's a good amount of levity and hilarious moments in this film, even going back to its Shrek roots, and doing a parody of some Disney elements. And the action scenes are an absolute joy to look at. So when the dark scenes do occur, it's not an instant slap to the edgy dimension. It's mature and naturally placed to emphasize the stakes, while leaving the audience with a satisfying impact. There's a reason why so many people began praising this film to high 
heaven, somehow reviving its previously underperforming box office numbers and solidifying it as a modern animated classic. It's really freaking good, and it's the kind of film you can only really get from DreamWorks. It has the DreamWorks stamp all over it. DreamWorks currently has two films slated for 2023, those being another Trolls film and a new IP titled Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. Trolls 3 looks about on par of the others, so we're not going to talk about that. It'll probably be fine, it's not for me. Ruby Gilman is interesting because it's another film from them with a much more stylized art direction, incorporating more 2D elements and blending them with 3D animation, though not to the same extent that Bad Guys and Last Wish did, which isn't a problem, I'm just very appreciative of the fact that DreamWorks is exploring different animation styles and not allowing their character designs to be restricted to realistic movements and proportions. As for the art itself, however, I can't say I'm the biggest fan of the look. All of the characters have this noodle-like quality to them, like they're ripped straight out of the Sonic Riders. I like how expressive the animation is and how cartoony the movement is, and the underwater scenery does look pretty stunning, but overall I feel the same about this art style as I did with Turning Reds. Looks fine, not my thing, but I appreciate it nonetheless. It's still DreamWorks being experimental. Also, this film is definitely making fun of Little Mermaid, like you do have to be blind to not see how derivative this design is of Ariel, and it is what I expect from DreamWorks. I mean, they usually do things just to make fun of Disney because they're incredibly spiteful and petty, but I have for some reason seen some people argue they're making fun of the live-action remake in particular, and these people are just grifting, honestly. I hate the live-action remake because it's a live-action remake. We are not the same. I guess it's also worth mentioning that DreamWorks has been the most recent property to receive the Sigma edit treatment, and a few of these are funny, but it also seems to be propping DreamWorks up a bit too high, as I've seen a lot of people get irrationally upset over DreamWorks making Trolls 3 and Ruby Gilman after creating Peak in Boots 2, and it's just another example of people not really getting the whole appeal of this company in the first place and how they've always been. The resurgence of DreamWorks has led to many appreciating the way they make movies, but it's also led to many people having a few misconceptions about them being on some sort of divine comeback after years of mid or something, and it's like, put the fedora down, you're talking about DreamWorks here. DreamWorks are just gonna keep doing their thing. They had projects in development at the same time as Last Wish, they aren't just gonna cancel them for no reason. But the critical and financial success of Last Wish does show that there is a market for more high quality 2D and 3D hybrids with more mature storylines. So who knows, we could get more films in line with those expectations sooner. But for the time being, DreamWorks is gonna keep making wildly different films for wildly different demographics, and it's gonna keep them afloat for a long time. And with Shrek 5 possibly on the horizon, as well as the announcement of a new Kung Fu Panda movie, or both of which have me scared because these franchises ended years ago, I have faith that DreamWorks will ultimately deliver on expectations with these, and will continue to experiment with their animation styles. For the time being though, I've gained a lot of newfound respect for this company despite me having mixed thoughts on a good few of their films, and I eagerly await what they have in store for the future. Also there are definitely furries in the art team, I'm just saying.